So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dina Cowan. I am the Educational and Cultural Programs Manager here at the National Nordic Museum. And I am delighted to welcome you to this Meet the Author event with Arthur Herman, who will talk about his book, The Viking Heart, How Scandinavians Conquered the World. Um, this will be a little bit different than we do usually. So uh, Arthur will give a presentation. And then after that, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. We do ask that you post those questions in the Q&A function on your screen, and we'll get to as many of those as we have time for. So um, this is uh, um, our Meet the Author series. We are thrilled uh, of how this has developed. During the time that we have been doing this since October 2020, we have been on a journey of Nordic themed literature that has been fascinating and interesting. And we're so grateful to have you here, Arthur. Uh, this series is in collaboration with Elizabeth Denoma. Uh, she is not only moderating our events, but she also her expertise in international literature, especially Scandinavian literature, has made it possible to present the most fascinating books uh, by authors and, and uh, with translators sometimes that we are uh, thrilled to have uh, in our on our programs. So, uh, Elizabeth Denoma is the founder and editorial director of Denoma Literary Services. And in addition to her uh, work as an editor and translator, she also hosts international book uh, events. As some, uh, among them are the London Book Fair and the Frankfurt Book Fair. So we are very fortunate to work with you, Elizabeth. And I'm gonna hand this over to you. And I do want to welcome everybody. We're so happy to have so many of you here today and especially warm welcome to Arthur. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. Hi everybody and welcome. Uh, before we start our conversation with Arthur Herman today, I'd like to share on behalf of the National Nordic Museum, the acknowledgement that the museum sits on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples and we honor with gratitude the land and the tribes. The acknowledgement doesn't serve as a substitute for authentic relationships with indigenous communities. It's simply a first step in honoring the, occupi the occupied land on which we live and, and to acknowledging the impact of colon uh, colonialism on indigenous peoples. The Nordic Museum celebrates the continuity of indigenous communities in the Nordic countries and North America through ex exhibitions, programs, and collections. And we cultivate respectful relationships with each other through these partnerships. Thank you. With us today is Arthur Herman, a senior fellow at the Hudson, Hudson Institute and author of nine books, including the New York Times bestseller, How the Scots Invented the Modern World, and Gandhi and Churchill, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Arthur, as Tina mentioned, Arthur is going to do a presentation about his most recent book, The Viking Heart, which you can find in the bookstore at the National Nordic Museum, among many other places. Um, we have a lot of people here today, many of whom I know will have lots of questions for Arthur. So if you wouldn't mind putting them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, I will curate them and aggregate them as the presentation goes on. Um, if for whatever reason we can't get to all the questions, I apologize in advance. I'm going to do my very best. And you can help me by putting them in as you think of them throughout the presentation. So hello, Arthur. <laughs> so nice oh, to how see are you. Good to uh, meet where you. Where we find you today? Good. Um, delighted to be here. Um, delighted to be part of the part of the program and to be um, speaking to all of you. Um, my one regret, I have to say, is that I can't be there in person. We, we have to do this virtually because one of the things I've always enjoyed about book events and doing presentations on my books is having a chance to meet the audience um, who, you know, for signing books and scribing them answering questions that maybe occurred to people during the lecture, but only afterwards or wanted to bring up when we got to meet one-to-one. -one. It's one of my favorite parts about book events. We can't do that. And I'm sorry about that. It's not exactly the same, but let's hope that the future will we'll be able to do that in the future together. I would love that. And I hope, uh, I hope that if you are, uh, if you're attending today and enjoy the book, we do something like that, you'll come back and we can talk about it. Uh, in, uh, in more detail. Um, this is a, a book which is, uh, I have to say, um, probably the most personal book that I've done. Um, not only in terms of what I write about members of my own family, uh, 
both of my mother's parents came over from Norway just before World War I. And on my father's side, his uh, great grandfather came over also from Norway in the 1850s, uh, just in time, as a matter of fact, to, <laughs> just in time to serve uh, in the American Civil War with the 15th Wisconsin Regiment, the, the Scandinavian Regiment, um, which I talk about in the book, as a matter of fact. So it's definitely in many ways a personal book. Um, and its origins lie in a way in the family ties at the same time, because, um, well, uh, when the Scots, when my book, How the Scots and Better in the Modern World came out, it became a New York Times bestseller. It was a bestseller, bestseller uh, across the Atlantic in, in Britain and in Scotland as well. And my uncle, Norman, my mother's older brother said to me, that's great. You've done a book on the Scots. When are you going to do one on the Vikings? And I thought, wow, that's a very interesting kind of question. I don't really know if I've got really the handle that I would want to do a book like this. This was 20 years ago, 2001. Um, and then uh, eight years later, I did a book called uh, Gandhi and Churchill. That book came out 2000, published 2008. Um, dual biography, and my uncle said, uh, after I was one of the three finalists for the Pulitzer Prize for the book, he says, that's great. Now, when are you going to write a book about the Vikings? And I knew that what he was talking about was not just a book about the Vikings per se. He really wanted a book that would talk about uh, the Scandinavian American experience and talk about not necessarily our family per se, but about the world that they, that shaped their views, the way in which they became part of the American experience. Uh, this was very much in his mind, as well as exploring the story of, the, of their ancestors, our ancestors uh, in the Viking age. Um, and I still didn't really quite have the elements put together with it. And it wasn't until about three years ago that I began to see the way in which I could do a book that would combine the story of the Vikings and the Viking Age, it would set right a lot of the myths and preconceptions that we've had about the Vikings, who they were, what they did, what the character of their culture and, and, and their world was, and their values. But they would also make a direct connection between what their experience was, how they shaped history at, at their time in, in, in Europe and the Middle Ages, and the way in which uh, the Scandinavian American experience uh, has been a major contribution, important contribution to the shaping of the history of America. Um, and I think, as you'll see, as we talk about at the end, about where America is going and needs to go in the future. And that's why I titled the book, The Viking Heart, because it's not just about the Vikings, when you, as the first part does describe uh, and look at the most recent archeological historical evidence, including the use of DNA research in a way in which gives us a whole new understanding about the Viking age and who the Vikings were. But the second part of the book is about the Scandinavian American immigration, what they found when they got here uh, to America and what changed and what influence they would have on shaping the future of America from there. So first things first, let's talk about the Vikings. Now, when we think about the Vikings, not just as people who have a, a should we say, an ethnic connection with it through Scandinavian roots, Dane, Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, Finnish, or Icelandic, the image that tends to come to mind, certainly in the popular culture, is one like this. This is a, um, uh, a chess piece from probably the most famous of the ivory chess pieces uh, found at a burial site in, in England um, of a berserker warrior. Um, and we think about the berserkers as being sort of your classic right? Viking super warriors, uh, men who had summoned up as, as a description was, and as they're described in the sagas as sort of summing up their inner animal nature as a bear, as a wolf, that makes them invincible in, ba in battle, recklessly 
brave uh, to the to the point of a kind of uh, manic frenzy in the battle scene. And this is kind of, I think, a lot of ways in which the popular culture has shaped the view of the, of the Vikings as being sort of, uh, should we say, super warriors uh, who spent their time raiding and plundering and pillaging their neighbors uh, and terrorizing Northern Europe for more than 200 years. Um, well, actually, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, there's no setting aside the fact that the Vikings were feared through, across Northern Europe for 200 years, uh, and that they brought to the uh, brought to the scene uh, a level of martial skill, of bravery, and of, of, of reckless daring that made them uh, really uh, bywords for uh, a dangerous foe and a dangerous enemy. And whose skill and whose frenzy in battle is, for example, commemorated in this ch chess set. A chess set, by the way, that we now know, thanks to DNA evidence, was made from ivory from narwhal tusks from Greenland. In other words, that this chess set found in England was part of the global trading network that the Vikings had established and that set up uh, across the Atlantic world already by that date. But of course, at the same time in which there's an element of truth to this picture of the of the Vikings and that and that long period of the, Vi the the classic Viking age, which runs from about 795 with the famous raid on the on the uh, in monastery on the English coast at Lindisfarne, 795, to usually we date the end of the Viking classic Viking age, 1066, and the Battle of Hastings. Um, when the last great Viking uh, Norwegian king, King Harold, is defeated by his rival, uh, King Harold of England, at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. But all through that period of time, it's important to realize that uh, pillaging and plundering was not <laughs> was not a full time application for the uh, for the Vikings or for the Scandinavian tribes uh, from which they arose that this was, if you like, a part-time activity, that, well, that, the, that, the, that the normal Viking, the average Viking, uh, far from being a super warrior, was in fact a farmer, a fisherman, uh, someone engaged in animal husbandry, and that the daring raids that they launched every spring um, from their homes in Denmark and Sweden and Norway, were in fact a way to supplement income to get the commodities and the manufactured goods that they did not produce themselves and which were necessary to the world in which they were going to live in a very hospital, inhospitable environment, uh, as we all know. Um, uh, freezing cold winters, of scarce material resources, very little arable land, uh, survival was a matter, first of all, of being able to find and get the things you need by any means necessary. But it was also, and this is one of the key ingredients, it's also a survival which depends upon the strength and the solidarity of the family, of the community, of the kinship group, the tribe. And this becomes one of the key ingredients for what we think, what I describe as the, as the Viking heart. Um, others call it, the, the, have referred to as the Nordic way. It's the idea that group survival is the key to survive, but at the same time, that individuals need to have the freedom, the ability to venture forth, to take risks, to go perhaps where uh, beyond the horizon in order to bring back the goods, the, uh, the processes, what's needed in order for the group to benefit and the community to survive. So from the very beginning to the Viking Age, we see this interesting balance between, on the one hand, reckless valor in battle, uh, conflict, at the same time, at the same time, uh, a willingness to allow others, allow members of the tribe, members of the community to take their own path, to have that freedom in order to bring back the goods and the things that they needed uh, in order to survive. Now, this is true for a lot of tribal societies around the world. What makes the Viking tribal survival path um, 
and makes the Viking heart uh, a, a, an important episode in history is the technology went with. And that technology was the longship. Um, and as we can see from this stone carving from Tanum in Sweden, from, which dates from uh, very early before the Viking Age, um, that the inhabitants there in Scandinavia were already working on boat designs and sea craft that bear a striking resemblance to the classic longships of uh, the Viking Age, and that is part of our you know, normal popular image of the Vikings as well. Uh, so it was, a, in fact, technology that came in two forms. One first was the longship, this incredibly seaworthy but uh, ship, but which one that also had a very shallow draft that allowed the Viking ship to travel not just in, in, uh, over distances, even oceanic distances, but at the same time was shallow enough draft that it could descend, it could make its way up river courses, um, almost as far as any kind of normal uh, river craft uh, could go. Gave the Vikings enormous versatility as far as maritime travel and sea and river travel. And then in probably the eighth century, uh, they added another technological innovation, which was the square sail, which gave them an increased speed and maneuverability that combined with the rowing, uh, the rowing team that would keep a Viking longship uh, in action and allow it to operate under all conditions of all kinds of weather. The square sail also gave it the speed uh, and at the same time, the, the, the ability to, to move forwards or backwards in battle or in action in ways that simply baffled their opponents. And so those, as I describe it in the book, those two technologies bring a level of shock and awe for the Viking raids across Northern Europe uh, on the other side of the Baltic, to Northern Germany, Northern France, to England, to Ireland and beyond uh, in ways that uh, their opponents were simply unable to keep up with or un unable to confront. Because by the time you summon forces to beat off the Viking raiders, they're already gone. They've come and gone, stolen what they want um, and, and, uh, and have fled back to sea before you can respond to it. Now, what we also know about these Viking raids, the classic Viking raids, is there tended to be a division of labor among the different ethnic groups that were involved with it, with the, those Scandinavian tribes living in the, in the, in the, in the modern-day Denmark, those in Sweden, and those in Norway. The Danish Vikings, for example, tended to make their way in their, in their expeditions uh, across the North Sea to the, uh, to the eastern coast of England but also the, north, the coast of Northern France, raiding as far as I have description in the book, the siege of Paris, um, rowing their way up the Seine River uh, to besiege the capital of the Carolingian Empire, but then also down around the coast of Spain through the Straits of Gibraltar, through the Mediterranean, all the way eventually to the Eastern Mediterranean, even reaching, reaching the port of Piraeus and Athens and their expeditions. The Norwegians, Norwegian Vikings, pushed even further west. And they were going to make their way not only to cross Scotland and to Ireland for a long period of time. Ireland was, in fact, as I if you read about it in the Viking Heart, Ireland became, in effect, a Norwegian colony um, with the uh, raiders and settlers who established their, their, their principalities and their power base there. But then, of course, to the Faroe Islands and then on to Iceland, Greenland, and then finally, finally reaching the course, the, the coast of North America, about 1,000, 1,000 uh, in the Christian era. Dates a little bit uh, shaky, but it's probably around that date that, that they arrived there. As for the Swedes, um, their Viking raids and activities looked eastward uh, across the Baltic. Uh, and then down the river courses of modern day Russia through the, the, the Don, the Dniester and the Dnieper rivers, uh, all the way down through to the Black Sea and eventually reaching as far as Constantinople, uh, the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire and the richest and most powerful uh, city in the world, which 
um, the which the uh, Viking raiders were besieged not once but twice from their bases that they established in the capital cities of Novgorod and Kiev. In fact, as I you'll, you'll find out as you read the book, um, it is those Swedish conquerors and Swedish uh, Viking leaders who not only established the original principality that becomes Russia, but also give it its name because the local Slavic tribes would identify that, them as the Rus, which means the men who row, which is a perfectly good description of Viking marauders during that period of time in the, in the, in the eighth and ninth centuries. But it's the ones who we think about who make their way across the North Atlantic that I think that capture our imagination most these days, not just in America. Can I get the next slide? And that is their arrival and their establishment of a settlement on the coast of Newfoundland, a settlement which archaeologists in the 1960s had discovered and began to uh, began to unearth. And that really proved that the Viking sagas that described that trip across the North America, across the North Atlantic to Vinland was in fact uh, based in fact and not simply poetic fiction. Um, the name we always associate with this Leif Erikson, um, because he's identified in the Vinland saga as being the leader of that expedition. But we now, and of course, it's he's given his name to the national holiday. Uh, to celebrate that arrival in uh, in North America, which is a week from today, as a matter of fact, October 9th. Um, but we also know that the uh, that the enterprise establishing settlements in North America by the Vikings was a collective enterprise, uh, and that there were any number of others who were involved in setting up the settlements and uh, in creating a series of bases from which Viking traders could engage in tra trade with the native tribesmen there and then bring their goods back to back to their original base, which was in Greenland, which Leif's father, Eric the Red, had established. Now we know from the sagas, and there's some, although the archaeological evidence is a little scanty, uh, that eventually the Native American tribes got tired of it, <laughs> tired of their um, other Scandinavian uh, 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 interlopers, and they seem to have uh, driven them out eventually for whatever kinds of reasons. The colony that was established at Vinland uh, didn't survive, uh, didn't stay uh, permanent. Uh, but it was, I think, still, it, 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 it's, it's an amazing tribute to the skill and the daring that these Scandinavians brought to the enterprise that they were engaged in. And again, but this was again not just a matter of, of of raiding and pillaging, but also of looking for land in which to settle, land in which and bases in which to do trade with those they found and those that they connected with at the time. And this is that it was that precisely that incredible daring, that incredible nautical skill that baffled their contemporaries, even as much as their um, as their. Uh, martial ardor and, and skill in battle. Um, contemporaries were also baffled by the fact that these formidable warriors, you know, who would uh, sack a town and uh, steal everything at a moment's notice, actually turned out to be great businessmen too. Uh, and so very shortly, in a very short period of time, the Viking uh, uh, raiding routes become trading routes. And really, as I talk about it in the book, and I think the evidence is pretty strong, that by 1000, by the time that they arrive, in fact, at the course of North America, these Viking um, explorers and settlers and, uh, and traders have really laid the foundations for the modern trading, overseas trading network, especially in the Atlantic. They're, the, they're really the precursors of globalization with tra establishing trading network, net networks that reach across North America and then all the way, all the way across Eastern Europe to Constantinople and even to Viking traders reaching as far, as far as Baghdad and tapping into the wealth of the, of the Middle East. Amazing accomplishment. The other thing that was baffling to outsiders was the role of women in Viking society. I talked a lot about this in the book. 
um, they were baffled by the fact that women seemed to be treated almost as equals in Viking society and uh, even in the Viking expeditions. We know women were very much part, for example, of the expedition that, that established Vinland. Uh, Leif Erikson's daughter was a, played an important role, uh, according to the sagas, certainly, in establishing it and, uh, and in fending off attacks from the from neighboring tribes. Um, we know that although Viking women didn't have what we would call political rights as such, they didn't participate directly in the tribal assemblies and things, which were the key to how Scandinavian tribes govern themselves with the consent of the government, with the consent of the government. But at the same time, they had other kinds of rights. They had, for example, a limited right of divorce from their husbands, which totally shocked um, outsiders, particularly those from the Mediterranean society in which women were kept very much segregated with no rights at all. This was a complete surprise that they had the right of divorce of limited and, and, and right of ownership of property. Again, very limited from our point of view, but extraordinary for the time. And they were also amazed to see that women were not only participants in these raids and in these battles, but were very often actively engaged in, in battle. Um, in fact, one of, the, one of the most amazing discoveries by archaeologists in the last couple of years is the gravesite at Birka in Sweden of a Viking leader, a Viking, uh, uh, if not a Viking chieftain, certainly a very important figure uh, in, uh, in, within, within the Birka community here, who for years it was just assumed was a man, but which DNA testing has revealed was in fact a woman. My guess is, is that as more DNA work goes on and is already underway, with looking at Viking graves and looking at the Viking presence around Northern Europe and elsewhere, that we're gonna see more and more of what we had assumed were the graves of men or the remains of men, of males, will turn out to be the remains of females uh, and uh, playing that kind of important role in the way in which the society was shaped and the way in which, again, the Viking heart was saw the element of, of freedom, the freedom that the community needs is one that is, doesn't distinguish between the role of men and women uh, from that point of view, that there's a certain equity in that freedom to pursue your own path and take your own direction. In any case, the other thing that was baffling and frightening to contemporaries about the Vikings was their fierce paganism, the pagan religion, which is, uh, gave birth to a splendid literature preserved in the Norse sagas written down by Icelandic uh, scholars and poets really in the 13th century, about 200 years after the height of the Viking Age. But one of the, and that the change when, when uh, Scandinavia integrates into the mainstream of Western Europe by converting to Christianity. Could we get the next slide? A change that is uh, really, in a sense, preserved and commemorated uh, by the, uh, uh, the, the appearance of the Stav Kirka, uh, particularly in Norway, but the, it's, a, it's an architectural design and the way of a, a, a church architecture which spreads across the whole Scandinavian area and eventually to Iceland as well. It really symbolizes the change that takes place as, uh, as Scandinavian society comes to accept Christianity and the value changes that take place in Embracing the idea, for example, of individual conscience, of a sense of individual guilt, which spelled an end, by the way, to the blood feud, one of the most disruptive social practices of Scandinavian society, of pagan Scandinavian society, that the church was fine, the Catholic church was finally able to end and bring to a, bring to a conclusion. And yet at the same time, as the Stavkirka architecture represents, as for example, in this slide, we can see the, the unique design of these kinds of churches. This isn't your classic Roman Catholic church at all. What they've done, what the, what the church builders have done is to integrate the, um, the, the, the carpenter skills, the skills of, of the Viking longships of, of, the, of their legacy, of their heritage into the church construction. We could almost see those Viking, the, the dragon prows of the longships in those designs 
uh, up at the at, up at the very top of the of the, of the Stav Kirka as well. And this is one of the things I think to realize, and I talk about this in the book as well, is is that what the coming of Christianity didn't end the values, the important values that made the Viking heart so powerful and such an important cultural skill set. It reinforced them. It gave them a new direction, gave them a new positive direction, as would eventually to the coming of the Lutheran Reformation and the teachings of Luther, that the idea of a, of a calling that all, that all citizens, not just those at the top of society or those in the clerical order, that all, everyone in society has a vocation to carry and to carry forth a calling to the world which demands of them their best, their out to output that is constantly looking to make it better, to, to, to make it more successful, uh, to make it more perfect, not just for ourselves, but as an expression of our love for our fellow human beings as part of our solidarity of the community. I talk about this in more detail in the book, but the Lutheran work ethic becomes embedded in that Scandinavian culture right down to today, right down to today, it becomes an important part of what shapes it in the modern Viking heart. The other thing that doesn't change, next slide, is the role of women. And uh, I talk about the prominence of three women in particular uh, in the Middle Ages, in Scandinavian Middle Ages, and the role that they play, St. Bridget of Sweden, uh, Queen Ingeborg of Norway, and then this formidable lady, uh, Queen Margaret of Denmark, who uh, completely bamboozled the, uh, her male counterparts and her male inferiors and, and cajoled and bullied them into creating the most amazing political uh, <laughs> institution in, in the history of Scandinavia, uh, which was the creation of the three crowns, the Union of Kalmar, which uh, she held together single-handedly until her death in 1412. Queen Margaret is, I believe, not just the most extraordinary woman in Scandinavian uh, Middle Ages, but probably the most extraordinary woman in the Middle Ages as a whole for the rest of Europe as well. Uh, the very fact that she was able to um, bring the three kingdoms, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden together and hold them together as a single political entity is something no Viking chieftain was ever able to accomplish and something that no modern political leader was able to accomplish either. But she did it. And the very fact that she was treated with the kind of respect that she was, even fear, uh, was I think an expression, not just of her own formidable personality, but also the degree to which in Viking society, in Scandinavian society, the role of women to be respected, to be wielders of power, to have an influence in political debates and in the shaping of, of, of policy becomes an important part of the legacy right down to today as well. Now I mentioned the Lutheran Reformation and the man who is going to, in a sense, exemplify that power that's unleashed by that Lutheran Reformation will be, uh, will come uh, in the century, the two centuries after Queen Margaret and that's Gustavus Adolphus, King of Sweden. We get the next slide. I have a long chapter, I have a chapter talking about Gustavus Adolphus and about his influence and his role in not just in the history of Scandinavia and Sweden, but the history of Europe and how during the course of the 30 years war, he really saved European Protestantism from the forces of the Catholic Counter-Reformation and the forces of Habsburg Empire, which had reached right to the shores of the Baltic and even besieged uh, neighboring Copenhagen. Gustavus Adolphus is one, again, one of the most extraordinary figures in European history, the greatest military genius of his age. Uh, the Battle of Breitenfeld, which we see represented here uh, in a print, the battle, uh, contemporary print, the Battle of Breitenfeld in 1631, um, which was a decisive defeat of the Habsburg powers, but all and Catholic powers, but also really established Sweden as Europe's premier superpower, a superpower status which um, would be cut short a year later by Gustavus Adolphus's death in another major 
Swedish victory at the Battle of Lützen, um, but which would leave its stamp on the shaping of Scandinavia for the next two centuries, because Sweden's superpower status, its role as a major great power in Europe, along with Denmark, um, would get both kingdoms uh, involved in European conflicts for the next 200 years, right up through the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, both the kings of Sweden and Denmark would feel it necessary for themselves to participate in the wars of coalition, great power politics. Uh, through it all, uh, it becomes an important part of shaping modern Scandinavia, uh, these constant wars and the drain on national resources that, uh, that, that Scandinavians were required to hit above their weight in great power, European great power politics in ways that were uh, fill the pages of history with glorious battles and glorious conquests, not just Gustavus Adolphus, but Charles X of, of, of Sweden, who had a, a Swedish army formidable enough that he could fight the Russians and the Poles and the Germans and the Danes all at once and beat them all. Um, it's an amazing story. It's, uh, as I say, great chapters in the history of European warfare. But Scandinavians paid a price for this. Both Danes and Swedes and Norwegians, who wind up being, <laughs> being the uh, subordinate either to one or the other of the two kingdoms. Uh, because the concentration on great power politics, on wars of conquest and competition with each other for power, um, meant that through the 17th and 18th centuries, the Age of Enlightenment, um, Scandinavia falls farther and farther behind the rest of Europe in terms of economic and social development. It misses out on the great commercial revolution that sweeps across the rest of, of Europe. It misses out uh, on the industrial revolution. So that by the middle of the 19th century, uh, the Scandinavian, Scandinavia, the Nordic countries find themselves uh, in a state of almost what we would call today third world underdevelopment. And as the population rises, as the numbers increase, Scandinavians poorest have no choice but to leave, um, to find a, a place in which they can uh, feed themselves and their families. And for most of them, for the overwhelming numbers of them, the place that they found beginning in the mid 19th century is America. Next slide. And here we know, or think we know, a large part of the story about these immigrants who came from Norway and Sweden and Finland and Denmark uh, to America to start new lives for themselves and their families, and who found here in America a place in which that cultural skill set that they had inherited from their forebears. Um, that belief in the importance of the community, the belief in the importance of hard work, because you can't survive in an environment like, uh, like Norway or Sweden or uh, Northern Minnesota. These are Swedish lumberjacks at a, uh, at a, at a, at a lumber camp in uh, Mora, Minnesota, snap during their uh, pictures snap during their break. This is in the 1890s. Um, and, but also to the belief that individuals have to be free to take their own direction, to find their own path, because the group ultimately benefits from this. That group solidarity doesn't mean group uniformity. Um, and that individuals have their own contribution to make as part of their devotion to a connection to the community, to family, to, the, to, to community, and ultimately to their new nation, to America at the same time. That that cultural skill set now finds a new home and, a, and a, an agreeable place in which to flourish and to take root in America. And so the second half of my book, which is really looking at the story of the great migration, of the experiences of immigrants coming to America, including, of course, my, my grandparents, the experience of those like my great-great-grandfather fighting in the Civil War because they believed that it was important that that having come to the land of liberty, preserve that liberty, 
that a land of liberty should not have uh, a slave, an enslaved population, uh, and that that protecting and defending freedom becomes an important part of that story uh, of America as a land of freedom, and who made their sacrifices, including my great great grandfather, uh, who uh, was severely wounded at the Battle of Stones River in 1862. All of those elements, all of those elements, become part of the story of America as it's the Scandinavian immigrant, American, Scandinavian immigrants come and settle and make new lives for themselves. And when we look, about, look at the different contributions that Scandinavian Americans make and that I talk about in the book, I'll just mention one for our purposes because our time is gonna run short in a second. And that's the contribution of, I think one of the most underrated poets in America and that's Carl Sandburg. I talk about Sandburg in the book, next slide who was the son of a Swedish immigrant growing up in, in Gales, uh, Galesville, uh, Illinois, um, growing, growing up in the shadow of uh, the uh, legacy of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Galesburg was in fact one of the sites for the Link, Lincoln-Douglas debates, which is what first drew the teenage Carl Sandburg to the story and the life of, Ale of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and who would really dedicate his life not only to writing great poetry, uh, to collecting American folk songs, uh, but also to writing uh, a multi-volume biography of Abraham Lincoln uh, that would win him the Pulitzer Prize, but which is also a, a, a hymn to the, to the idea of freedom. Uh, and that, though that biography, the biography of Abraham Lincoln that Carl Sandburg did, is really the work, as I talk about it, as I described in the book, it's really the, the work that, that made Abraham Lincoln into the central figure in the American pantheon of great heroes, of the man who made American democracy and made American freedom real by ending slavery, by, by preserving the union, and for embodying the kinds of virtues that Sandberg saw embodied not just in middle America as a whole, and not just for Scandinavian Americans uh, who, were, who made their home in the, in the Great Plains states, but also as a part of a legacy, a legacy for American freedom as a, as a concept, as an ideal as well. And when we think about the importance today of the Gettysburg Address, the importance of uh, Abraham Lincoln as a, as, a, as a kind of archetype of American heroism and American leadership, uh, we owe so much of that to the work, the dedication that Carl Sandburg brought to it and to that activity. Finally, I think we can think about the biography of Abraham Lincoln as being in many ways a kind of an American saga, an American uh, equivalent of the Norse sagas. Next slide. And here is a part of the Viking legacy that really has lived on to the present day. The Viking sagas, the Norse sagas were written down in, uh, by the poets and writers, the skaldas as they're called, the skaldas in Iceland. Iceland was originally a Norwegian colony. Uh, it was one which uh, uh, brought and preserved much of the Viking culture as it, uh, as it was, had been left during the classic Viking age. Um, that was in many ways a kind of a self-enclosed world, uh, very distant from the Norwegian kings that ruled over it and uh, who held formal title to its, uh, to its, uh, to its territory, but, and, but who also were deeply proud of the Viking um, stories and of the Norse mythology, that though they were Christians themselves, that that Norse mythology contained poetic truths, truths about America, about human life, about human character, uh, as well as being splendid stories that deserve to be recorded and deserve to be, uh, be, be preserved for posterity. And it's those Norse sagas, those works, including, for example, the saga of the Volsungs. This is a carving from one of the Norwegian stav kirka of the hero of the Volsung saga, the hero Sigurd, 
slaying the dragon Fafner in order to uh, capture the treasure, which the dragon Fafner uh, is guarding and protecting. Those no sagas become some of the most important and influential works in European literature ever, particularly in the 19th century when the rediscovery of the Viking heritage in the Viking world takes place. And those Norse sagas, particularly the Volsung saga, will inspire two great writers of, of and I would say artists of genius. The first is Richard Wagner, uh, who will take this the Volsung saga and turn it into the story of Sigurd and turn it into the Lord, to the, to the uh, Rings operas with his hero Siegfried and his on again, off again relationship with his faithful bride, Brunhilde. And then also J.R.R. Tolkien will likewise take the Nordic myths and the, and the Nordic mythology and, 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 and use it to, to inspire and to shape his Lord of the Rings trilogy, which as a work of fiction and as a work of literature will go on to inspire fantasy and science fiction writers and movie, movie directors and, uh, and producers uh, right down to the present day. And I'm not just thinking about you know, the, the Thor movies uh, or their role or, or Thor's role in the, as part of the, the Marvel um, movie uh, productions, but also I'm also thinking about the influence that Tolkien had on The Lord of the Rings and on uh, the the, the, the Lord of the Rings movies and also Star Wars. In fact, a lot of people don't know that George Lucas's next project after finishing the original Star Wars trilogy was to create uh, a film version of The Lord of the Rings. He didn't do it, didn't ra couldn't raise the money in order to do it, so it fell to Peter Jackson, uh, it fell to Peter Jackson to do it instead. But so what I'm saying is, is that the Viking legacy lives on. The Viking heart continues to shape and direct we, how we think about our culture, about the, the key elements and conflicts in our culture right down to today. And I think in the end, it may be one, maybe this may be the most important part of the Viking legacy is the legacy it leaves to all of us uh, as a pathway forward, as a way to, to undertake and to take on the most difficult tasks, to take on the most important risks, the importance of freedom within community and reinforcing and building community. These are perennial values. And these are ones that I see as embodied in the Viking heart. And that I see the story of the Vikings, the story of the Scandinavian Americans and their experience here as being important episodes in that story as it reaches back to the past and extends out to the, extends out to the future. Well, thank you very much for listening. I know we've got some time for questions that I'm happy to happy to address whatever questions come uh, come to mind. Thank you so much, Arthur Herman. That was for that really insightful uh, presentation. Elizabeth, I think your mic is on. It's on, right? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. you can, okay, great. Okay. Arthur, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. My oh, my good. my. Uh, my, my speaker my speaker went out. You could hear me, oh, right? right? I can hear you perfectly. Great. I was okay. just thanking you for your presentation. It was like, it was just so lovely. I was wondering how you were going to summarize aspects of this really dense and fantastic book. And you, it was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. We have um, a number of questions for you, but I think we'll start with a really general one. What, sure. were some, what are some myths about Vikings in the Viking era that you hope your, your book can put to rest? Well, I think one of them is the idea that they were these sort of super warriors whose only interest was, you know, going out and uh, plundering and pillaging. And that was it, you know, that they're kind of, um, it's a sort of that life in the Viking world is a sort of perpetual fight club, you know. And if you ever watch movies, you ever notice this? They're, either they're always fighting their neighbors and, and, or they're feasting and reveling. You know, it, it, it's like, oh my God, how could they go through this every day? You know, these enormous feasts of roast oxen and so on. Weren't there any times that Vikings just sort of said, you know what, let's just boil a couple of eggs and turn in early tonight. Um, <laughs> well, they probably did because, because their life was hard. I mean, it was, you know, working as farmers, working as, as fishermen. And that's the real work of being a Viking, being part of the Scandinavian uh, world at the time, 
And in the spring, yeah, sometimes you sort of say, let's go Viking. You get together 30 or 40 friends and you set out, right, to go do a little bit of trading, to go a little bit of stealing and looting when it suits. And not just, of course, uh, your Northern European neighbors, not just the hapless English or the Irish or the Germans or the French, it's also on each other. That's the other myth. We think about the Viking raids as descending on a helpless Northern Europe. Vikings spent a lot more time fighting among each other. Danes against Swedes, Swedes against Norwegians, Norwegia against them both. Uh, it's the story of it's the story of, of, of life in, in the Viking world. Um, and no, always knowing that you have to protect yourself because what you have uh, is always vulnerable to, uh, to your neighbors who may covet it and say, I want that because I need it. And you have to be ready to defend itself. This martial skills that the Vikings built uh, that made them such fearsome warriors came through hard experience, fighting with other Vikings, fighting with other Scandinavian tribes. Uh, and that's as much a story and it's the one that's actually preserved as much in the sagas. In that sense, the sagas really run true. Uh, and less so when we look at it just for the pattern of, 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 of the Vikings as a part of the Middle Ages and medieval history. Absolutely. One of our um, attendees today asks about Iceland. Can you describe Iceland's Viking culture? For example, did Iceland's inhabitants trade and otherwise exchange with Western Norway more than with other parts of Scandinavia? Well, Iceland, that's a really great question too, by the way, because um, Iceland in many ways became a kind of greenhouse as I was hinting at this in the lecture in which sort of old Viking ways get preserved through the middle ages and even preserved after the, the, the transition to Christianity from paganism. Iceland was an important, uh, should we say trading post for trade to Norway, uh, to the, by the way, the Norwegian settlements in Iceland as well, to get to the goods that were coming from Greenland, like that, those Nor Norwal tusks uh, for making chess sets and other kinds of implements and commodities. And also from then the trade coming out of, from, from North America, which we don't, I mean, the evidence is very scanty about it, but a lot of it probably was again, lumber coming out from being shipped across the Atlantic to Greenland. Not a lot of forests in Greenland, even fewer in Iceland. So the need for lumber, the need for, uh, for sources of it meant that you wanted to be able to trade um, commodities coming from the East, from Norway, or from Denmark, or from England and Ireland in exchange for the commodities that you're getting from from further west. Yeah, so it's, a, it's and, and Iceland is an extraordinary story too in a lot of ways. It, we think about it today, of course, as part of the Nordic countries. Icelanders get very offended if you leave them off from that point of view. But at the same time, they're different. And part of it is, is that the fact that they were so isolated for so long a period of time um, after, that, after the northern, after the, the, the Atlantic trading routes with Greenland, as the Greenland settlements declined and then vanished, likewise with Finland, Iceland's place as a trading location descends. But that sense of community, that sense of solidarity, sense of hard work, boy, let me tell you, Icelanders can have that you know, to the nines to this day. Uh, I have a great, I have a great connection with the Icelanders because my family would go vacationing when I was growing up in Wisconsin to Washington Island, which is a big Icelandic immigrant community, as a matter of fact. So, um, hey, they're an important part of the story. So are the Finns. And I also wanted to make sure in the book that the Finns got equal time as well and became part of the story, uh, in, the, in the story of the Viking heart. Even though ethnically and linguistically diverse, they're as much a part of the story as the Icelanders or the Danes or the Norwegians or Swedes. We have uh, a couple of questions. What is the misperception of people who are currently misappropriating Viking culture to defend white supremacist, white nationalist propaganda? And what is it that they have not understood about Viking culture? Well, I, I, it's a, that's another important question. One I address throughout the book, really, right. because that is one of the, it's not only, not only a, a political travesty, it's an historical travesty. 
because one of the things that DNA evidence shows beyond doubt is the fact that the Vikings were never a distinct DNA group as such. They were a distinct racial group. That the Viking, that the DNA study shows that the Viking settlements, the Vikings themselves were made up from a whole range of different ethnic groupings and and also DNA traces as well. Uh, from Southern Europe, from Eastern Europe, your typical Viking expedition would, a Swedish expedition would include Finns, it would include uh, people from, from the Baltic tribes, it would include Slavs. Uh, the trip across North America includes Scots uh, and Swedes as well as, as, well as Norwegians uh, and a sprinkling of Irish as well. What DNA has shown is number one, that the Viking influence and the Viking presence is much more extensive than used to be thought here. That in the course in the British Isles, perhaps as much as 10% of the people in the, in the British Isles have some kind of Scandinavian descent, which is owed to those Vikings. But what it also shows is that the idea that, that, that racial characteristics are the key to understanding cultural differences uh, doesn't hold up. It's, it's not true. My very first book, by the way, Elizabeth, The Idea of Decline in Western History is a, is a long discussion about this and about how racial theorists were seized upon the, Nor you know, the Norwegians and seized on the Scandinavians as proof of you know, pure Aryan race and so on. It's a theory which had, of course, horrific consequences later on in the 20th century. But it's also one that modern science, as well as history, simply destroys and blows up. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I can't wait to read that one as well. Please. Um, we have a couple more questions. I think we can take just a couple more here. Um, did you find much evidence of shamans in historical Nordic communities? Oh, very much so, particularly during the pagan era. Um, we can see that. And again, women have an important role in this too. You know, they are, they are very much uh, treated with a kind of respect um, as being shamanistic influences uh, in the culture and in the direction. The, the, the issue of Viking women is an issue that I think historians are just beginning to explore. And shamanism, the role of, uh, of, of women as preservers of what we call occult practices and even occult magic, it's a fascinating story and it's an important part of it. I want to say one more thing too, it touches on this real quick. And that is, is that that respect for women, particularly older women, you know, who are to be treated with respect for their experience, for their skills, for their leadership, had it also effect during the Christian and Lutheran era as well. And it's one of the reasons, as I speculate in the book, it's one of the reasons why the witch, the, the, the witch hunting and witch burning doesn't really seem to have much effect in Scandinavia compared to the impact it has in France and Germany uh, during the same period, during the 17th century. Yes, there are witchcraft trials, and yes, there are wit witches who are condemned and executed, but the numbers are very small. And I think it's because uh, in, in France and Germany and other parts of Europe, uh, women, single women, elderly single women make were important targets for witchcraft accusations. Whereas in Scandinavian society, there was a regard for and respect for their role. So uh, the impact of the witchcraft, hunt, uh, witch hunting and so on in Scandinavia is much more reduced. And I think it has to do again with that Viking and Viking legacy and, and the respect uh, and view of women very different from other parts of, other parts of Europe at the time or, or before. Thank you for that. And here's, um, what was the nature of the relationship between Vikings and the indigenous Sami population? Um, well, first of all, both come from, that we could say this, that both came from the same ethnic stock. Um, the life, uh, <laughs> the life cycle, the, the culture of the Sami is not that much different from that of the Vikings after all. Everybody is working really hard to survive those winters and to find a way uh, to uh, find a way to, to subsist um, in an environment as inhospitable as that. 
I think in a lot of ways, the, um, the, the, the Samis are, again, uh, left to do what they have to do. We know that they've probably engaged in marauding expeditions where they joined the Scandinavian tribes with it. But you don't find, as far as I know, you don't find that kind of interest in, uh, in shall we say, treating them as kind of you know, indigenous peoples or anything along those lines. That discussion comes uh, comes later on, and the the desire to uh, to 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 stamp out Sami culture is one that comes much later in Scandinavian history. It's not a happy chapter in a lot of ways, um, but it's uh, I, I think that we can say that it's a it's not an important it, it's a it's a that within the Viking world itself that they're too busy trying to survive on their own. To pay much attention to those who are uh, the Samis have nothing to <laughs> there's nothing to steal. Let's put it that way. Um, there was certainly a certain amount of trade, particularly with regard to animal products and, and hides and so on. But uh, but by and large, the attention to the Vikings and for Scandinavians through the Middle Ages is southward to the more developed and to the richer neighbors to the south, and how to get get stuff from them through trade or other means, that's their that's the Vikings' real preoccupation. Thank you. And we'll take one more question. Were there any areas off limits to marauding Vikings? Any areas off limits to um that's an interesting question, isn't it? Um and I can't think of anything. I think that what we do, I'll tell you this, what is interesting is, you know, the early Viking raids were very much on targeted monast Christian sites and Christian monaster monasteries, Lindisfarne being the classic example. And what we know now is, is that the reasons may not just have been that they were largely defenseless, you know, monks didn't have soldiers to defend themselves or they weren't armed to do that kind of thing. And it wasn't just because their reliquaries um, were, you know, sources for precious metals, uh, which the Vikings, you know, happily took and then used as part of their larger training networks. There may also have been a strong animus towards Christianity and towards the way in which Christians had treated their fellow pagans, the Saxons, during Charlemagne's reign, um, in which uh, there was a whole series of campaigns of ethnic cleansing conducted against the Saxons by the Franks. And we know that the Saxon leader, Vidukin, took refuge in, uh, in Denmark, in the kingdom of Denmark. I'm sure it told them about what it was like having to endure the persecutions and attacks and massacres by uh, their Christians and that as pagans, they could expect similar treatment. So I think there was a certain degree of, shall we say, reprisal raids about those early attacks on the Christians. But other than that, I think nobody was off. It's certainly not your fellow Scandinavians, you know. As I say, the, they fight many more wars against each other, even Norwegians against Norwegians, Danes against Danes, than, uh, than they ever do with anybody who's who, uh, further, that requires a longer voyage uh, and more time and effort. Thank you so much for that answer and just for your entire presentation today. So enlightening and engaging. Anybody who has not yet read this, I urge you to do so. You can pick it up at the National Nordic Museum Bookstore um, and other places online too. Fascinating read. And now I thank have you. your other books on, uh, to get to too. Uh, so um, thank you again so much. It's been, a, it's been a treat to talk to you about the Viking heart. Appreciate um, it much. It's been it's been great. Thank you all for attending. Thank you so and, much. And thank you for the great questions too. They were they were really really like that. Thanks everybody today. In the next session of Meet the Arthur, we'll be talking with Susanna Herbe about her research into winter swimming and the many health and other benefits that arise from plunging yourself year round into open water. Um, in closing, please consider making a donation to the National Nordic Museum through their website if you're in a position to do so. Details available on the website, the nationalnordicmuseum.org. Thank you all once again for taking part today and hope to see you next time, if not before. And thank you so much again, Arthur Herman. Thank you. Take care.